All right, it looks like I've got everybody out of the lobby and signed in. I want to welcome everybody tonight to uh, our MIOC Orthopedics Bear Implant Talk, The Bear Necessities, Bridging the Gap Between Traditional Rehab and Sports Performance. We have our esteemed colleagues. We appreciate them getting on tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Brian Lau, Chris Antonelli, and Ryan Kimball, and all from Duke. And I'd love to turn it over to Dr. Brian Lau to start us off. Well, thanks, Mark, for the introduction, and thanks for everyone for joining um, late on the on the Tuesday uh, evening. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the bridge implant, and then really kind of spend most of the time talking about the rehab process. Um, and part of that is me, Chris Antonelli, who's been one of our leading um, therapists in our rehab group, and in a lot of, in charge of a lot of our return to play testing and sports activities. And then we have Ryan Kimball as well, who's, a, who's our director of our FIFA Medical Center, working with a lot of our soccer athletes and kicking athletes. Um, and so we're gonna really lean on their expertise as we go forward here. So we'll just um, go on to the next slide and just go into a little bit about um, what makes a bear implant different. So you can go ahead and click through here. And so I think we all know about the uh, reconstruction and that's you know been the workhorse of how we treat uh, ACL injuries. And then, you know, there's, obviously been uh, different techniques for repair and, um, and lots of different literature out there. And it used to be a more popular and then kind of the pendulum swung the other way and we started doing less of them uh, because there were some differences in outcomes. Um, but the difference with the bear um, kind of restoring everything where we kind of bridge both the repair with these newer technologies. So um, it's a unique um, technique in terms of um, getting people back from ACL injuries. It allows us to you know, maintain the native anatomy, which has a lot of proprioceptive factors and, um, and also prevents any morbidity for taking a graft. And so that's what we're talking about here. And if we go into the next slide, uh, what does that uh, entail? Um, it's basically, uh, I don't have the video there, I guess, but um, we can go back. Uh, basically what it is, is we, we do a primary repair and we, um, this implant, the bear implant, is incorporated into that repair, which has a lot of different factors um, in order to help the ACL repair itself. And that's what makes this kind of unique in that it's a, a repair plus an augment, which is um, put together and obviously um, required to Tumayak, but it's uh, pretty um, good results and techniques. There's more than 1,500 of these done throughout the nation right now. Um, and so we're learning more and more about the rehab. So we go on to the next slide. Right. And so um, one of the things, you know, we obviously have other ligaments that are in need that heal very well on their own, in particular like the MCL. Um, and the reason that the heals well is because we have um, good blood supply to it, um, you have, which allows it to get a lot of the growth factors and allow it to heal. And so the bear, the way this um, technique helps is you do the repair, and then you bring in all those things to kind of make this more of a uh, healing environment for the ACL. Um, and so then we go into the next slide. And so there's been uh, multiple studies that have been done um, and all showing that the equivalent outcomes in terms of knee laxity and patient reported outcomes. There's actually a trend toward less injury to the contralateral side, which we know is a big um, kind of area of um, you know, research and then trying to understand why people get their contral lateral side injured. But what we've noticed that the bear implant and potentially because of maintaining those native fibers and appropriate receptive fibers can help uh, decrease the risk of contral lateral side. And again, patient reported outcomes, strength, time to return to play, all those different things seem to be equivalent or slightly better with the bear implant. Uh, and additionally, if someone has to kind of revision, you've haven't burned any bridges, you're going to be able to use those grafts you would typically use for reconstruction um, with um, no changes or any kind of worrying about tunnel sizes um, and all that too. So, you know, it's slight advantage if that were to happen. Okay. Next slide. Um, and so one of the biggest questions is like, who are we doing these on uh, and how are we doing them? And so you know, the bare implant is really can be used in any, any patient. Um, it can be used in the weekend warrior. It can be using elite athletes. It can be using young athletes. Um, and throughout, you know, all the studies out there that show that they can be used on these and they are being used. And so of those 1,500 that we talked about, um, we are using them all 
cohorts and we are as well as at Duke. And the biggest thing is kind of, you know, even though a surgical technique may be very similar, how we rehab them and how we um, approach them and how we discuss with them can be very different. And that's how we'll highlight that uh, as we go through the talk here. So I'm going to the next slide there. Okay, and so what's our Duke experience? I think we're actually at 30 now um, and we have a couple more later this week. Um, and you know, our, our age range is from a young to 13 up to 53. So again, wide range. Um, and our first case was in uh, March of 2022. So we are, um, you know, beyond a year and a half, almost two years coming up, so we're not too far from now. And um, have changed our technique a little bit in terms of surgically and have learned a lot about the rehab. And um, again, that's what we'll be focusing mostly on here. Uh, as you see, the varying amount of sports and levels in terms of recreational, um, D1 level, and those elite levels as well. So, next slide. And so we're going to kind of think of this in, in two big uh, cohorts. The one is the, the standard kind of active population, weakened warrior, and how we approach that. And then the second cohort is how we think about these in the higher level athletes, um, whether that's going to be cutting, pivoting, tumbling, or impact type sports, and how the rehab might be different for those type of athletes. I'll go into the next slide. And so this, we're going to highlight this, but this is the first case, maybe a 33-year-old uh, male sustained ACL while playing recreational soccer. He likes being active, kind of doing gym exercises and running. So again, this is more of your weekend warrior who likes to play with his kids potentially, getting out to recreational sports, likes to be active and healthy. Um, as you can see here, this MRI, what makes this tear a little bit different than most ACL tears that you actually see some maintained fibers in there um, right in the middle which can be, is a sign that these can do very well with the bear. And so you go into the next slide, so we indicate this guy for a, a bear implant. And this is kind of how we do the repair. So at the top left there, you can see that there is very good maintained fiber, just clearly a tear there. Um, and our technique, we, you know, we won't go too much into our technique surgically, but uh, we do these more of suture anchors rather than buttons um, and suture tape. And as you can see here, we get that nice repair that you can see in the top right. And then the sutures that come out, we kind of incorporate into the, a bear implant to that and pull that in, which obviously we don't have pictures because we keep the scope very dry when those go in. But this is kind of a standard um, bear for us and a standard kind of recreational warrior. Uh, and so we're going to pass this on now to Chris Antonelli, who's going to kind of talk about the rehab for uh, your general uh, patient. So Chris, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Um, and as Dr. Lau introduced at the beginning, I've had the good fortune to be able to work through a um, variety of these bear techniques since the origin here at Duke. Um, with a lot of what I do, taking people through the return to sport testing component. Um, so I've had a good, unique experience and opportunity to compare just kind of internally the difference between some of how these bear um, patients are doing versus some of the traditional reconstructions. So I'm going to talk about the earlier phase of the uh, the PT protocol, and just to remind everyone that this is the the bear repair. So it's it's by no means treated the same as a reconstruction. Um, so with that, some of our initial earlier differences in this initial protocol are where weight bearing is tolerated. Or excuse me, we're partial weight bearing. We're not weight bearing is tolerated. So we're going to be about 50% weight bearing with two crutches um, compared to with the reconstruction typically. If there's no concomitant meniscus, meniscus involvement, we're usually weight bearing is tolerated with the brace. Um, in terms of our uh, brace use, we're typically going to be in this brace for six weeks, um, locked in extension for sleeping for six weeks as well, um, where traditional reconstruction, you know, based off of quad control, that may vary. Um, in terms of our range of motion, there'll be some range of motion differences as well, which I'll highlight for you. But the main goal with this is that you know, we, still with our higher level athletes, we're looking at return to sport at nine months. Um, but some of these weekend warriors, we could be looking at them getting back a little bit earlier, about seven months or so. Next slide, please. So this here is kind of a, a nice graphic on the different phases. So there's going to be the seven phases that we're going to cover at various depths. Um, but my role is to take us through week 30, where we're really going to be talking through the return to sport testing. That's when I'll turn it over to Ryan Kimball um, for a little bit more of the late stage items of this. Um, but next stage or next slide, please. So early on, um, weeks zero, th or zero through four, which is phase one, this is that early, early post-op phase. Um, so again, we're going to be partial weight bearing with crutches, and this is where the range of motion restrictions are going to be very important. We're going to be restricted for the first two weeks to 45 degrees of flexion, 
then weeks two through four, we're working towards 90 degrees of flexion. Our main goals here are really to minimize pain and swelling um, and improve quad control. And what I've seen from my own experience is a lot of these folks really do have significantly less pain. There's no um, grass harvesting, harvesting going on. Um, so, you know, it's minimally invasive compared to other reconstruction. So a lot of times, way less swelling that we're combating, way less pain that we're combating, which allows us to get a little bit earlier function, which is really neat to see. Next slide. The other key component here that we want to be mindful of is that when we're working with range of motion, we're not doing any passive range early. We're working on active range of motion. So a lot of this is finding what is the appropriate um, active range of motion exercise for the individual patient. Do they have any guarding perhaps going on? Um, are they comfortable more supine? Are they comfortable more sitting? I find more people to be sitting off the edge to be a little bit more comfortable using gravity um, to assist them. So I think that's something that's very key and, and a big key component and difference between this and a reconstruction. Again, we're looking for a really good quad control here, quad activation. Um, so considering NMES or blood flow restriction for these patients is going to be important. And then if you have access to an Alter-G, that's a great way to work on some gait training uh, while using the brace early on in this phase. Next slide. So there's some good literature out there to suggest um, NMES is a really good modality to help improve quad activation, um, especially after post-operative post surgery when you may have some arthrogenic inhibition. So these are some good parameters per the literature that um, you all may take note of and, and try utilizing with your own patients if you haven't used um, this um, these parameters for NMES. I know a lot of folks use Russian stimulation out there as well, which is a great option, but there's a lot of evidence leading towards NMES symmetric biphasic as being a great option. Um, we really like to work on this early quad set and achieving active knee hyperextension. Um, and, you know, when they have the available range of motion, some knee isometrics at various ranges of motions are, can be shown to be really helpful in promoting some quad activation, quad function early on. Next slide. So we're fortunate to have three Delphi devices for blood flow restriction here at Duke Sports Medicine. Um, I know they're expensive, so I know a lot of people don't have access to them, but I just wanted to highlight some of the really good benefits for blood flow restriction, just for those that maybe aren't familiar. So again, our main goal with um, ACL rehab, especially with the Bayer or even um, reconstructions, we want to get the patient back to loading, progressive overload. Well, early on, maybe they're not able to do that. So that's where BFR is a really good tool that you can use because it'll help combat muscular weakness and atrophy and be that bridge until high load strengthening is tolerated. We really want to use utilize it um, by working to fatigue and hit that lactate threshold. And this can really help simulate um, some significant strength gains similar um, as traditional strength training but, training, but at this lower load. We're also looking for some physiological adaptations by um, creating this uh, restriction of blood. We're creating that ischemic and hypoxic, hypoxic environment, which can help in, uh, activate some of the anabolic processes, which are important for hypertrophy and, and other systemic effects. Next slide. So there's some potential mechanisms involved here. So increased systemic growth hormone and norepinephrine Pivotal one, you get some really good long lasting effects with that um, just by using blood flow restriction for up to 15 minutes. Um, there's also a suppressive effect on myostatin. So we know myostatin inhibits uh, muscle growth. We know myostatin is very um, common when um, a knee is very inflamed. So this is a great way that we can help combat that. Some other benefits are we're really working towards more type two motor unit production, um, which is important for improving hypertrophy and strength gains. Um, and then we're also going to try to maximize the benefits. So what is good dosing of this? You know, if you have access or have um, the resources, trying to do this two to three times a week can be very beneficial, often combined with NMES. Next slide. So now we're transitioning to phase two. Um, this part, we're really moving into uh, weight bearing is tolerated. So this is weeks four through seven. So we've just come through our progressive um, 50% uh, weight bearing, working on quad activation. So now the key is where weight bearing is tolerated and how's their quad control? We'll consider unlocking the brace if they have good quad control, but still being mindful to keep it locked for sleep until six weeks, locked in extension. From now um, throughout the rest of this early phase, we're working on gradual restoration of range of motion. So we protected early for the first four weeks. And now we're working through again, some more active range of motion techniques to fully restore range of motion as tolerated. Next slide. So here we are um, 
not significantly different in terms of our interventions from phase one, though pending range of motion, we really want to think about getting into some long arc quad motions, activate the quad even further. We know knee extensions is a great way to isolate this. Um, so this is what you're keeping in mind. It's safe to do with um, with the bare implant, safe to do with the repair. Um, so we really want to do um, start thinking about the best ways to further activate the quad because anyone that's rehabbed an ACL knows it's all about the quad. So it's really no longer about the quad in terms of getting people back to function, long term knee health, all of that. Next slide. So if you have um, these great options, which we're fortunate to have as well, these could be good tools to improve gait training. Um, Alter-G, great way to introduce um, weight bearing, uh, work on some symmetry, some, some actual mechanics of things. You can do it similarly in the pool. Aqua jogging is permitted at eight weeks. So again, if you have access to these, very um, could be very helpful to use. I fortunately have seen in our practice that a lot of these folks come back feeling pretty good. So I haven't really had to lean into these options heavily. Um, but what I have had to use more so Alter G than the Aqua or the Aqua setting. But knowing, hey, you know, it's all about the quad. If their quad functions coming along, pain and swellings controlled, uh, we can really start working on some progressive walking gait mechanic type things. Next slide. We're going to phase three here, um, weeks seven through twelve. Again continuing to really focus on quad strength. Our goal in order to advance to phase four is not only time of 12 weeks, working on our range of motion to 90 degrees, but what's our quad index looking like? We want our quad index to be about 60 to 80% um, limb symmetry. So you can be using handheld dynamometry to assess this as you go. Um, qualitatively, are they doing straight leg raise um, without a lag, looking for multiple repetitions of this? There's some things that just kind of clinically you can be eyeing and, um, and then basically guiding your interventions on. It's like, okay, how's their motion? What do we need to do there? How do we continue to improve range of motion is tolerated? What's the quad looking like? So NMES, isometrics, continuing with BFR, working to more progressive overload with open chain, knee extension, and, and general closed chain would also be very appropriate in this phase. Next slide. So we know that after a ACL injury, there's some neural compensation that occurs. Now we have disrupted proprioception within the joint with the mechanoreceptors. So we, we find it very helpful to start thinking about um, working into more of these um, dual task type things, improving neuroplasticity and proprioception. Um, once they have some good strength, um, definitely find challenging their single leg stability with various ways um, that you know you all have probably seen before in clinic. Just really get creative with these people. You know, it, it's a it's a long rehab. And we know that we have to challenge proprioception and neuroplasticity um, as we go, and, and starting early with this because um, that's going to make a huge impact as we go later on in the rehab. Next slide. So here are some various techniques that we do um, with, with which may be familiar to a lot of folks um, in terms of our dual task um, challenges. So. You know, we, everyone's probably done some ball toss or staying on an air X pad or a BOSU, but we have blaze pods, which we find very helpful in terms of um, challenging the athlete, challenging the patient. So we do a lot of these other cognitive challenges where, you know, uh, if the pod lights up blue, they need to do a squat or do a lunge. If it lights up red, they do a lunge. Have them count backwards by sevens. Have them call out different colors based off of what they see versus what it is. So anything that you can do to get creative with them, um, call out, you know, have them identify a fruit that starts with, you know, a certain letter. All these various things have forced them while they're doing a single leg task is very important. And really starting early and a lot of the, the younger athletes we find, we have find this to be a lot of fun and a good, good way to keep them engaged at this phase of the rehab. Next slide. These are a couple options here. So um, the athlete in the blue on the, on the left two slides, he's a goalkeeper. Um, so here we are doing some side plank type items, uh, throwing a ball at him, having him do punches um, to start simulating a little bit of goalkeeper activities. In the middle here, there's those are the blade pods, blaze pods, um, where he's basically doing a uh, TKE in a low load, long duration stretch to achieve a little bit more of that extension. And he's throwing a ball, catching a ball based off of what color the pod lights up. The gentleman sitting down, here we are just doing a little bit more of just kicking and kind of getting a long arc quad involved, <laughs> long arc quad involved on the surgical side. So again, another way to stimulate um, both sides, stimulate interest in what their um, sport may be, their hobbies may be, and keep them feeling like they're rehabbing for that end goal as well. Next slide. 
So early on, just a few clinical pearls here. Um, you know, of course, minimize pain and swelling, gradual restoration of range of motion. I really haven't seen anyone get stiff, fortunately. Um, everyone's motion does come back very well um, at this point that I'm seeing. A whole lot easier than a lot of the um, other reconstructions that I've seen where maybe there's some stiffness associated with pain or some guarding due to pain, um, but motion tends to come back very smooth, but just as a reminder, no passive range in this phase. <clears throat> wake up the quad. Um, anything you can do early, we really wanna wake up the quad, working towards that quad index of over 80% 80, 80 limb symmetry, and then really normalizing gait and augmenting the rehab with some of these dual task challenges. Next slide. <clears throat> So now we transition into phase four, weeks 12 through 20. So anyone that's been in the rehab setting knows that this is all like on a sliding scale. There's no real like direct linear progression as we hope. It does sometimes go up and down. Um, so we're still working on achieving that full extension and flexion within 10 degrees of the opposite leg, progressing strength. <clears throat> Again, emphasis on progressive overload. You know, I think historically uh, PTs as a profession tend to underload. And I think we got to get really good with loading these people um, of all really of all pathology, but definitely AC, ACLs because we know the importance of long term strength and long term uh, return to sport, long term knee health. Um, so really emphasizing progressive overload, not just the quad, but hip, hamstring, calf, all of that. Um, using isometrics as needed, really continue with NMES as needed, BFR. But hopefully at this point, you've kind of bridged that gap from from needing NMES or BFR and you're really more so in progressive overload with uh, with more traditional strength training and getting them in the gym. Hopefully at this point, they're really transitioning into the gym, really taking accountability for their rehab in addition to PT to really continue to accelerate their rehab. Uh, next slide. This is also the phase when we start really considering the return to run process. Um, so, you know, people have, I have had people run as early as 12 weeks. You know, I think there's a push for running a little bit later and I totally understand um, running a little bit later. And I think most cases running around 16 to 20 weeks is totally appropriate as well. Um, but a lot of it's gonna be dependent on the athletes. So my weekend warriors, you know, that aren't as committed to the gym, we're running a lot later, um, mainly because we need their strength to be good. I want their running quality to be good. I want their pre-running low tolerance to be good. So these are just a few parameters, of course, that you can, that you can all read to, to see in terms of, all right, what are some of the criteria that may, that needs to be met in order to return to running. Um, not included on this list, but you know, having that good relationship with your surgeon, getting the clearance from your surgeon is important to return to run. But I, mean, I think one of the most important things here is, you know, how is their quad strength? Um, and what's their pre-running load tolerance? Are they swelling with some pre-running activities? Um, is there pain with pre-running activities? Um, being mindful of all of those. Next slide. This is the um, the return to running program that we use here at Duke. Um, we aim to strive for the low irritability column. You know, this is based off of your um, just your symptom scale of zero to ten. So ideally, we want them to be on this low irritability, not really trying to run with a painful knee or swollen knee. Um, we start off with just intervals. Um, this is after we've done some good progressive loading. We've done some pre-running drills. And we start this on like an every other day interval-based training system, just to gradually introduce running to this athlete. Um, you know, some weekend warriors I've had, like, I don't really want to get back to running, but I think there's something to be said for quality of life and running. I think it's a big um, kind of victory in the rehab process to get to this running point. I think it gives people a bit of a second wind in throughout this like grind of not just the physical component, but the mental and emotional. Um, so I always use running as a good goal. And I think it's a good low hanging fruit, fruit for us as PTs to strive towards of Let's get them stronger. Let's work towards a goal. You know, let's have a little bit of fun with this. Still prioritizing strength training, of course. Um, but the running is a, is a big monumental phase. Oh, just lost power here. Sorry about that. Um, next slide. So, you know, a lot of this, this talk is kind of this bridge to sports performance. So that initial slide was the return to run. Just as, we're just talking jogging. Here we're going to have some of our athletes that we're trying to get back to sprinting, high speed running, um, cutting, pivoting, all of that. So we need to work on their load tolerance to that. Um, so we've been going heavy on quad, but of course we want to get some eccentric hamstring, um, some heavy uh, calf strengthening, ga uh, gastroc soleus strengthening here, and our plyometric training going on here. So there's so many ways that you can do this, but we're big believers in Nordics, wall drills, um, tantrums as well, just to get this high impact, a high 
high velocity um, hamstring activation, because all of these are going to be important as we return, return to high speed running. Of course, we want our limb symmetry to be about that 80 85% symmetry. We don't want to set someone up for potential hamstring strain, quad strain, anything of that sort. So those are things we're monitoring as we build these people up for high speed running. Next slide. All right, I'll turn this back over to Dr. Lau to introduce our next case. Well, thanks, Chris. So thanks for reviewing that. It's kind of our approach in terms of the rehab for you know, the weekend warrior. And this is where we're going to kind of highlight a couple cases of what we might consider as, you know, a higher level or elite athletes. Uh, and so this is a, a case of a tumbling athlete. This is a D1 cheerleader who suffered an ACL injury unrelated to her sport, but uh, while she was abroad on, and injured her uh, on a scooter injury. But obviously her goal is to return back to competitive cheer. Um, and uh, as you can see, again, she has a tear for ACL, a little bit more significant than the, the last case, um, but she does still have some of those fibers there, um, as you see on, the, on the, the image on the left and on the right, kind of those, those dark fibers attached to the tibial component. And so we tell these patients that you know, we'll, we'll attempt to do a bear, and obviously if we go in there and the tissue is not um, holding the sutures, then we won't be able to. But these, you know, with these MRIs now, we're thinking of them differently. We're used to just be like, okay, there's an ACL tear, and we just go ahead and do a reconstruction, and now we're kind of this adding another kind of um, tool in our in our tool bag where we think about um, doing this bear implant. So, um, okay. and so these are just pictures of her case here. You can you can see on top left that there is a full tear for ACL, but there's obviously good fibers that still remain. Um, and so this is a great candidate for the bear technique. And you can see we actually did a, a, a technique where we actually incorporate a little bit. There was a um, kind of a little um, extra little piece that kind of flipped into the front and we actually did a couple of extra sutures to kind of incorporate that. And that's what the bottom left demonstrates um, with a, a, a special kind of lasso technique to kind of bring those in. Um, but again, you can see the bottom right is that final construct of that repair, which is a, a key part of the case. Obviously the repair has got to put that ACL back in the right orientation. And then you add the implant over the top to help bridge that and um, uh, complete the repair. So again, another case of different, um, uh, a little bit higher level in terms of the um, uh, the patient being, uh, you know, a D1 athlete. This is another case, again, so a 39-year-old older patient, but he's, um, you know, we would consider a high-level athlete and that he's a special forces operator. Uh, and, and, you know, his, his sport is, you know, defending our country and, you know, his activities and being able to return to sport is kind of life and death for him. So, uh, again, you see this case here. She, he actually came to us looking for the uh, the bear implant, and you can see that he does have fibers in there. You know, we were a little bit more questionable whether or not this would be a great candidate for it. Um, but I think you know this case will highlight in terms of the imaging is not always perfect. Um, and so uh, when we actually get into the operating room, we actually can see that he actually had good fibers here. You can see in the bottom. You know, when you first get in there, this ACL is actually flipped into the front, which is the top left image there. And then the bottom left, we're actually able to bring this back and you see there's actually good fibers there. So it's actually, you know, um, I think that as you pay more attention to the graphs and the types of tears, um, really you can, there's more people who are actually candidates for the, the bear implant. Uh, and so again, here we are passing our sutures here um, and, um, you know, seeing that final construct there with the right, you know, pulling this, be able to pull this back over. Um, interesting for him, he, you know, again, life or death situation for him. He had great range of motion all the way to full, near full extension, but needed some hyperextension, which he felt like he lost compared to contralateral side. So at seven months, we went back, he had a little bit of a cyclops, which you can see again here on the, um, on the uh, far left, a little bit of a cyclops lesion, which we debrided. But you can see his ACL is fully healed. He's got, you see some remnant of the old sutures, but his ACL is intact. You can see the middle, and then we pull on it. He's got, you know, normal tension on his ACL. So it was great, kind of a second look. And uh, now he's back out and um, back at 100% um, and full activities. So again, different uh, level of high level athlete. Um, and then the third case we're going to do in kind of a cutting pivoting. Um, and you're also a younger athlete. He's this is a um, you know was an academy soccer player, really high level, um, at that, um, and planning on you know being very competitive going forward. And you can you see again same images here. Um, there's some intact fibers there. Um, and, but, you know, he was uh, a great candidate for the bear, as you'll see in the next slide here again, um, ACL fiber still intact, just kind of pulled off and able to get a good repair, as you can see in the bottom right here again, the repair of our, of our, of our technique. So, 
again, it's highlighting that there's when we say elite athlete, there are coming different flavors and different goals and um, you know aspirations, and that's just how we kind of cater our rehab based on what their goals are. And I'm going to swing this back to Chris, which I think is to highlight a few things, and then we go uh, over to Ryan to highlight some more of the things of how we approach the higher level um, goal specific athletes. Thanks, Brian. So yeah, so here we are. You know, we're going to continue to progress through this rehab process. And anyone that's done any long-term rehab knows there's so many ups and downs, turns that we take as we go. Um, so with this phase five, you know, we've already worked on kind of a, we're comparing like our weekend warrior, some of our high-level athletes. The goal is let's improve our strength and let's really get them back to running. We get some more of our higher-level athletes, but also applies to our weekend warriors. We need to really work on some of the hopping stuff. Um, we're working towards, you know doing some performance testing, but we're not just hopping to perform to see how they do on a performance test. We're hopping to improve quality of life, hopping to prepare them for the next level. So we're gradually increasing our running and distance um, time, making sure there's no increase in pain. But we're starting to really work on this eccentric landing control before we work into more power and explosive stuff. So this is a nice graphic that um, I like that kind of highlights our typical progression. Um, this is not just um, to us, but this is a common approach out there where we really work on this eccentric absorption for first, then working into more propulsive development, phasic coupling, followed by continuous jumping and shock methods. So we're kind of catering our rehab in terms of how we're going to apply interventions based off of these principles to help prepare the athlete for all the upcoming demands to help prepare them for whatever they see on the field, the court, whatever it may be. So again, here's a little bit of a plyometric continuum. These are just brief examples of different eccentric absorption or jump integration techniques. Um, we're really looking for sagittal plane excursion, eccentric knee control initially with our quality of movement. And then we start to work into more of that rate of force development, power production um, as we get more into our true like jump integrations and concentric development. Another lower body vertical progression. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. So if this is new to you, I, I encourage you to just, you know, read some of the literature, go, check online. There's some great videos, but various things that you can use. And we have some really cool tools. And we have um, four stacks at our clinics. So we're able to really see the quality of movement as we are working through this phase of the rehab. So here's um, a video of the uh, of the single leg fall um, jump on a on a vault four stack. So this phase five goal, our goal is 50% hop height. So we use this for direct feedback. Um, we can get the, the data directly to us like real time, which is really cool. But if you don't have that access, that's totally fine too. We're looking at quality of movement. We're looking for feel factor, asking the athlete, how does it feel side to side? And again, using these five different stages in terms of your jumping and hopping progressions and assessments is a good way to help navigate this phase of the rehab. So this is our test battery. This is unique to us, though it is very similar for most of these bare procedures. Um, everyone's doing uh, ideally some sort of strength test, whether it's handheld dynamometer or using isokinetic testing. We're getting the patient reported outcome measures using the IKDC and the ACL return to sport index, um, as well as hop tests. We're looking at the leaning error scoring system, looking at quality of movement, as well as then what not only is their limb symmetry, but what's their quality of movement with these other single leg hop tests. Then we're looking at the ligamentous laxity with the KT2000. Now, with my experience doing these hop or doing these performance tests um, for a handful of years now, going on six years, um, it, it's interesting to see that a lot of these athletes are doing way better at the six months because um, typically there's less pain. You know, with um, often with the BTB or quad tendon reconstruction, some of these athletes um, battle some tendinopathy. These, I'm not seeing that. Um, we're able to load them pretty progressively, uh, pretty linearly, where sometimes in the earlier phases of those reconstructions, we're battling pain. So I've been very pleased to see how well these athletes are doing at this six months post-op. And then even comparing um, some of the ligamentous laxity, uh, anecdotally on my end, I'm seeing great stability, not just side to side, but also when comparing it to some of the other reconstruction approaches. And this is just um, a highlight of a graph, one of our isoconnect tests of one of our athletes of the academy soccer player. He crushed his six month test in terms of um, peak torque as well as in percent in relation to his percent body weight. Um, so this is one of those things. Well, he he was kind of proof in the pudding that he, that not only did he feel good, because a lot of people during this early mid phase feel really good. But we know like, hey, there's still a lot of work to be done. Not only was he feeling good, he performed really well, um, but that's just more of a education piece for us of like okay we're so early still a lot of work to be done 
but this is just one little case of how well someone did at this six month test. And then, you know, now as based off of what we talked about earlier, thinking about returning to sprinting, making sure their quad to hamstring ratio is really um, about 70% is very important. How's their quality and what's their performance on their hop testing? And have they completed the walk to jog program? That's going to be our initial criteria to return to sprint. So our big clinical pearls here is we're working towards that quad index at least greater than 80%. Ideally, again, a lot of them are getting very close to that, if not already there, but we want to just keep really focusing on quad strength, running without pain or effusion. Then we're really looking at the quality of movement for hopping, um, both double leg as well as single. We want to see not only their um, physical, physical readiness and performance testing, but what's their psychological readiness and how can we better intervene to address both of those then moving forward, we're going to continue our innovations based off of the results and then working towards their end goals, which is where I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Yeah, great. I'll try to bring it home as succinctly as possible. I'm going to be a little bit fast and furious just from a time standpoint. Um, but this is kind of the, the last little bit where you're taking um, your creativity, your expertise um, in the science of, of rehab, and then adding in you know, what kind of athlete am I working towards? And that's where you start getting a little bit creative with your, your interventions um, with going forward. So next slide, please. Okay. So in phase six, um, advanced training, this, this is roughly um, weeks 30 through 36. Um, so now you're progressing like straight line running um, to more multi-directional running, curvilinear, some different figure eights, um, progressing your hop progressions, um, and just kind of define the hops and jumps. So a jump is off of two feet, um, landing on two feet. A hop is um, off of one foot and landing on the other foot. Um, are we good on slides, Brian? Yeah, okay. It's like a little lagging on my end, I apologize. Um, again, we're doing looking for our hop test to be um, getting a little bit, pushing the needle forward, 85%, as well as your quad index, 85%, because um, really we're getting ready to start getting into return to sport. So we want to make sure that quad is, is stable. Um, and of course, getting clearance by the surgeon to begin some of these return to sport type activities. Um, so kicking, tumbling, and you're not doing full effort. You're just gradually getting back into it, using kind of progressive overload. All right, next slide. And so I think similar to like the unreloading as, as a PT kind of group, I don't think we do a great job with this um, transition from like gym-based rehab to that return to sport. This is where the on-field rehab kind of comes in as that missing piece to bridge between the two. Um, and so that's where I want to spend a little bit of time discussing is this on-field rehab. So again, the on-field rehab is taking tapering down on some of the rehabilitation kind of in the traditional sense goals um, and ramping up more higher level sports performance type training principles, if you will. Um, and the return to sport is a continuum. So when we say return to sport, it doesn't mean um, when they go back to sport, they're going to go back to a game. They're going to go back to some um, individual drills, um, team drills, back to competition, and then back to performance. And so on-field rehab, a um, couple of really good articles out there from the Della Villa, the um, father and son do out of isokinetic group. Um, they, they applied theirs to soccer, but they, these principles can be applied across multiple sports. Um, and that's where the, the art of this comes into play. So take these principles, whether you have a soccer player, um, a cheerleader, uh, special forces, or what have you, and, and put your own little flavor on um, these main principles but the four main pillars um for good on-field rehab you need to have good movement quality and good motor control good mechanics um you know so we're looking at knee valgus that's like one of the biggest things that you see hip internal rotation knee valgus is re-tearing so you want to look at um improving that physical conditioning starting to get their bodies their load tolerance up getting their cardiovascular endurance up their muscular endurance up starting to do some individual sport specific skills, whether that be dribbling a basketball, um, a little dribbling of a, of a soccer ball or what have you. Um, and then developing that chronic training load. So this is where you gradually start building up weeks and um, 
of like higher speed running, long distance, long distance running, depending on the sport, you know, basketball are going to do more short sprints here and there. Soccer is going to be a lot more longer distance running. Um, you have a 90 minute game type of thing. Um, and then the five stage program, this is again for soccer, but again, you can apply it to, to any sport. Start with straight line movements, progressing to multi-directional cutting, pivoting, change of direction, um, sport, sport specific skills, which are one of the pillars, again, you're progressing that sport specific movements kind of go along with the multi-directional movements. So I would add sport specific, but also position specific. Um, a defender might look a little bit different than like a, a midfielder or forward or um, even a goalkeeper. Um, and then this is where you're trying to get them back to to team training, modified practice. And some of it initially is going to be just uh, individual. All right. So back to this return to train. Um, individual is when you can start this in the phase six. What that's going to look like, I want to introduce kind of this control chaos theory um, by Matt Taverner. Essentially just says that you want to start um, with a very controlled environment where you can um, be in control of what's going to happen. You're not anticipating um, anticipating any things or reacting to any things. Everything is very predictable for the athlete. You're just trying to get them moving well, getting their confidence level up, and gradually getting them back just to start getting back into sport. And then eventually you'll progress through this controlled chaos theory. But in the first, this phase, you're going to stay in that high control, maybe progressing into a little of that moderate control. Um, you want to really control these variables. Um, also in phase six, um, now you're taking that sprint progression and you're pushing the needle up a little bit more. Now you're going up to 75% intensity as long as you meet those criteria that is set forth. Again, we've harped on this quite a bit. You need that quad and the functional testing to be at least 80, 85% before we consider that. Um, and it's a pyramid, the, this, this, the progression is, you know, starting with some short sprints, pyramiding up to like a really long sprint and then tapering back down. And this is to be done every other day. Um, so it takes about a week or so. And then you progress to stage three of the, the, la of the sprint progression, which is the last phase. Now you're basically at a full sprint, 90, 100% intensity. The work to rest ratio does go up because you're sprinting so hard and the distances of your sprints do come down a little bit. And this might get pushed into phase seven a little bit. Um, I just put it here just so it kind of flows, but this might get pushed into phase seven. The, the criteria to get to this point would be 90% quad index um, and functional hypothesis, but some people might have it. It's, it's hard to say, um, but I am finding, like Chris has said, we're finding these bare implants to get that quad back much sooner. You're not getting that autogenic inhibition that you're getting with a reconstruction infusion like a patellar tendon. Um, so they very well may be able to, to get to this stage three right in the um, phase six of the protocol. Um, so if we move on to kicking. Um, so I, I work with a ton of soccer athletes. Um, two of the more recent bare implant um, patients we've had for high level club soccer athletes, one from Texas and one from the Philadelphia area. Um, and so one of the things we have to consider for them is when can they start to kick and what do we need to do to prepare them to kick? Um, so a lot of these goals should be met. That 80% quad index, that should have been met quite a bit a while ago. Um, I think the biggest reason this is in this phase is that clear to begin running, cutting, pivoting. Up until this point, that has not been um, cleared in the bear protocol until phase six. So you really probably shouldn't begin any sort of kicking progression until this phase. If you could click through, Brian. Um, so if we look at, we have to consider like the stance leg and then the kicking leg. So when we talk about the stance leg, um, we're looking at a lot of eccentric quad control to kind of counteract some of these ground reaction forces. Um, they should be ready if they're already sprinting. You're not going to be sprinting typically when you're going to kick a ball. It's going to be much slower of a speed. So they should have the good quad control by this point um, to support their weight when they go to plant and kick. Um, and both for like a kick with the laces or the inside part of the foot, um, the vastus medialis MVIC is roughly 228%. So for that, I'm thinking we need to um, do two things. And I use the Kaiser pulley quite a bit for this. We need to work on speed of motion of knee extension and then a quick catch 
We're working on eccentric hamstring control to control that really fast and hard um, quad contraction that's happening um, just to control and put the brakes on on the follow through of the kicking motion, if you will. And so if they meet the criteria, you can go to the next slide. Um, meet the criteria, there's this interval kicking program by uh, Amy Arendale, a long friend of mine. Um, and so it's, it's pretty long. It's, it's, it's basically starting with some two touch short yard passing, um, progressing to one touch, um, longer yard passing some basic chipping, lofting kind of drills, long balls, and then some advanced shooting. Um, and this follows similar to like the soreness rules that are out there. So um, as long as the knee is not reactive, you can progress. If it is reactive, maybe take a little break, you, re you repeat a step or even go back a step. Um, just again, it's gradually loading this athlete, getting the athlete ready to um, get back to sport. Um, so this is a really good resource if you do have any kicking athlete. This could be used for a punter as well um, in football. Um, if you have any kicking athlete, this is a really good resource to help guide what this process looks like. Um, I'm not going to go too deep in this, but again, there's some other resources out there. There's the control chaos theory again. This was from Matt Tavener again, um, applied to basketball. Um, so if you're not like so privy to um, some of the sport that your athlete is in, you know there are some resources out there um, to help guide some of the on-field rehab. There's also one for um, hockey. All right. So also in this phase, this is a really good time since they're preparing to go back to sport to begin an injury um, risk reduction program. The ones we commonly use um, are the, the FIFA 11 plus. Um, the FIFA 11 plus kids is for ages 7 to 13, and then the, the middle one, the 11 plus, is for 14 and older. Um, the Australian football group came by, and they basically just put a little tight, little tiny spin on the uh, 11 plus. And I like that they added um, the uh, Copenhagen exercise for adductor. Um, and so I tend to use a little bit more of the Football Australia version, but it's based off of the 11 plus. Um, which is very well researched and has been shown to be very good. But it's essentially a warm up, focuses on movement control, um, especially like landing, um, and then some general strength of core, hamstring, quad, um, and then adductor. And so some of the research out there um, in females in this cohort, in the 13, 18 year old, it does reduce injuries by about half. Um, and then similar results were found in males in a, in a similar age grade, in an age group. Um, just under half all injuries were um, reduced. Um, but the biggest thing is um, compliance. Um, it doesn't work if it's if you're not compliant with it. And um, kind of the minimal effective dose is two times a week. Recommended is three times a week um, to really be effective and get some of these results. All right. And then this leads into, again, some more performance testing at nine months. Um, and this will kind of give you some information on can they grow back to team training? So up to this point, they've been doing some individual work. When can we reintegrate them back to the team into a more chaotic environment? As we'll see, we'll go through that control chaos theory again. Now there's going to be a lot more going on. You have other players to, to contend with. So after you do um, your testing, um, now we're talking about return to sport and the true return to sport continuum. So we're, Again, we're shifting the needle away from re gym um, based rehab and more into sports performance rehab, really heavier loading, um, working on power development, rate of force development, explosiveness, agility, all these things going from non contact more to contact. Again, shifting the needle more chaos, less control. Um, and those are some of the criteria. And these are kind of standard criteria across the board. You want about 90% limb indexes for hop tests and quad um, and then clearance from the surgeon. And so we're going to go in a little bit about the return to sport continuum. So here's getting back to team training. So with team training, basically you're saying um, the athlete is ready to go back to the team, but not yet ready to play against other opponents. So the, the, if we think about the control chaos theory, there's still some control over these variables. Now you can pick and choose what activities they, they are allowed to do which ones maybe you want to hold off to do, but typically we're going to start with non-contact technical work, 
progressing into contact. You're trying to build up the acute and chronic workloads up to match levels without creating a reactive knee. Um, again, continue your strength and conditioning. You're monitoring key performance metrics. So you, we were lucky enough to have the vol and um, I can look at some of the jumps and just track them over time, make sure they're meeting some norms or their asymmetries are, 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 are low. Um, continuing that re injury risk reduction program, making it part of the routine. Like I said, it needs, you need to be compliant with it. And then another thing is um, looking at making sure they're confident in their knee, feeling ready that they're able to go back to sport. I mean, that's been shown multiple times that if an athlete is feeling a little wary, they're not going to succeed as well. So then shifting back to once you build up that, there's that control chaos theory, again, shifting the needle to the, to the right, if you will, less, less control, more chaos, more unpredictable, reactive, um, more game simulation activities um, so that they can get back to um, return to play. And so return to play, now we're talking about they can play, but maybe they're not meeting at their pre-morbid level. Maybe they're um, typically probably starting with limited minutes. So for soccer, maybe they're coming in like the 65th minute, getting 25 minutes in or something like that. Um, basketball, it's a little bit easier because you can sub on and off throughout throughout the game as well as some other sports. Soccer is a little bit trickier because once typically once you are come off, you're done, um, and there's a limit on subs. But essentially, you're just trying to – build up their minutes slowly over time, that same progressive overload, and continue the same things that you're doing in the return to train stuff, just progressing everything a little bit more. And finally, return to performance. So here, return to performance. Now you're, you're trying to get them, in my opinion, trying to get them moving better than when they were doing before the injury. Um, not to say that that's the reason what caused the injury, but if we can get them stronger, more controlled than before injury, there's potential chance of reducing that risk of injury. And here's where they are going to be playing full game minutes. Um, and again, continuing their injury risk reduction programs. And as you can still monitor some of those key performance metrics um, throughout their season as they develop, just to make sure that um, you're not missing anything and that they're still continuing along their, their good pathway. So here's just a, reha uh, a recap of kind of what we talked about. There's a lot of overlap, but hopefully this will help guide you when you're you're going through the process. It gets a little muddy towards the end um, about when to start when. And this is just a guide. Um, use your clinical judgment and your, your objective testing. Definitely do objective testing. I think um, we talked about we do our formal functional testing at 6, 9, and 12 months, but I personally do serial testing along the way. Um, whether I just get them on the ice or can I do a quick little strength test one day um, before their functional test um, or get them on our force plates that we have just do a couple different jumps, see where they're at. That way I know if I need to modify anything that we're still staying on track that we can do that. But hopefully this will help guide you a little bit um, on how to get your athlete back to back to sport. Um, and don't be afraid to to ask for help if there's a sport you're not comfortable with and seek out some of the, the literature out there that will help guide you. Um, so I encourage you to kind of look at some of the control chaos theory and some of the other work out there um, for your athletes to help guide that process. Um, and then the kind of the last things to, to not forget and overlook, and this should be looked at throughout the whole process, nutrition and hydration. We have to support healing muscle growth. Um, we have a sports dietitian on staff. I frequently will refer patients to to support um, support them, especially if they're maybe um, a young female who is de dealing with some like red reds kind of stuff, um, or if maybe the strength isn't where I want to be, maybe I need some more protein. Um, so psychosocial well-being, obviously, we want to make sure we, if you need to refer out, that's not of our expertise, but just being aware if you need to refer out, same as mental health, um, getting an athlete's sleep. They need to heal, and their, their body's doing a lot of healing and um, strengthening, so make sure in their sleep so they can maximize kind of all these things that you're doing. These are just going to help support those processes. The next slide, some of the reference. So if there's anything you um, wanted to look back up to, there's there is a copy of some of these references, like the control chaos, if you wanted to look at. And if you want to reach out to me, I'd be happy to, to, to just share some more stuff, um, talk more. Went through that a little bit quick just from the time standpoint. Um, this last slide, just a... Uh, the three of us at the TST this past summer um, with a million dollar check. Unfortunately, that wasn't a real million dollar check. Um, so that's why we're still here. But 
Um, really fun tournament. So I just want to thank you all for, for coming on this Tuesday night um, on behalf of Chris and Brian um, tuning in. Hopefully you learned something and took something away. You can go back to your clinic next week and the months going forward and um, change your clinical practice and help, help these athletes. Um, so I'm going to open up for um, questions um, and any discussion. You know, well, first, I want to thank Ryan and Chris for going through that. It's obviously a lot of information and as a surgeon, that I, um, eye-opening for how much uh, obviously goes into the rehab. Um, I know Mark is monitoring the chat box, so if there's anything, questions come up. Otherwise, I'll start off with some questions for you guys. Um, so I started with, with Chris, you know, you know, one of the things that, you know, often asked by patients to me is like, what's the difference in the rehab early on? And I know you guys both mentioned a little bit of the quad thing. Um, but what do you find is like, if you had to tell you know, if a patient comes to you and said, what are the two things that are different in the rehab in that first, you know, six, eight weeks? Like, what do you find is different? Yeah, I think with the typical reconstruction, um, we are doing a lot more passive range of motion techniques, um, a little more manual therapy. I think oftentimes there's a little bit more pain, um, some guarding. So some some manual therapy can be very beneficial to restore some motion. Um, you know, a straight ACL reconstruction without any meniscal, perhaps, restrictions in range of motion. We're not necessarily um, limiting range of motion to 45 degrees early either. Um, we're just taking the motion as it comes and gradually working on on that. But um, still, similarly, we are focusing heavily on early active extension, um, passive and active extension. But the flexion will be a little bit more of the bigger change early on. Yeah, I'll I'll agree. I'm, I'll I'll agree. Agree. I'm oh, sorry. A lot of those range of motion restrictions are in the first month there. Do you, do you find that any of the patients are having trouble getting that range of motion back after that? I have not seen that yet, to be honest. Um, I've seen that the motion really has come back very smoothly, um, very little resistance. Um, I think there's also a big psychosocial component that plays into these um, bear procedures as well. Um, where a lot of folks feel very confident in their knee and they, and they they're, they're no, they know the research, they're current with it all. And I think that also helps because um, they're feeling good. There's less pains. So there's less restriction with, with their motion. Yeah, I think that, that's good to highlight because I think a lot of patients worry about that, you know, oh, I can move a knee right away for red gray ACL, whereas if a bear might slow down. But I think it's, I see it on my side as well, but it's good that you guys see that as well, that that's much change. Um, and the one question either for either one of you guys, you know, you mentioned the dual task neural, you know, stuff. How quickly you guys are doing that? And, um, you know, how do you know when to start that? You know, obviously, it looks like it could be pretty complex doing multiple things at once. So how, how do you know when to start that? And how early are you seeing that with bear patients? I mean, maybe not the first week, but once they are able to bend their knee and hit that range of motion goal and can get some quad, I'm starting it pretty early. And a lot of times I'm adding it to like a quad exercise. Uh, we've done like a heel slide with a blaze pod, setting it to 45 degrees and I'll have them, all right, here's your target. I want you to bend your knee when that lights up to that fourth grade. So they have like this visual target that they're looking at, um, gives them like a little competition, if you will. Um, straight leg raise too we can we've done um the blaze pods on a mirror type thing and they're doing a straight legs rated raising it to the pod um or adding a different color now they're adding like a sit up to do some core work so um we're just kind of adding it to what we would typically do in a traditional exercise and just adding some sort of dual task with it so i'm doing it pretty early maybe not the first week i think the first week i'm just trying to calm get some swelling down um, get some range of motion back. Probably like after two weeks, I'm 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 hitting it. I don't know about you, Chris. You're muted. Sorry. As soon as they have appropriate quad control, um, at least from a, a standing, I try to get them on their feet early. Um, once they're through that weight bearing uh, restriction as well, I'm trying to get them up early and trying to instill confidence as well. Yeah. I think that's you know key, especially if the quad function being better of the bear, you can probably get that started even earlier uh, in these bear patients, which you know gets people in their rehab quicker um, and potentially quick. We haven't looked, obviously studied that yet, but potentially getting people back earlier. Um, and then Rhino, what you, you brought up the controlled chaos theory a couple of times, which I think is a really interesting uh, concept. Um, and you mentioned in terms of how you progress people, so this is at the point where now we're thinking about returning them to play or to the court, getting them ready. And you're talking about progressing through a different amount of control. And you mentioned changing the percent intensity from, you know, whatever, 90%, 75%. Like, 
how are you determining that progression? Like when you say, okay, you've met 75% intensity, is it quad function? Is it amount they're sweating? How, what they're just reporting to you? How do you know when to progress to the next phase of chaos? Good question. So yeah, it's it's kind of, is the knee reactive? Are you getting pain? Are you getting instability? Are you getting swelling? That's one of the first things I'll look at. Um, haven't seen any of that. And another one is like confidence in the knee. Um, if they're not confident with just like controlled motions or showing good movement control, I won't progress them. So I want to make sure their knee's not reactive. Um, and I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't start it until they have good quad control here. We're starting to talk about getting back to sport. So they should have a, at the very least 80% quad, quad index, if not more. And I think with bears, you're, you're, you're not going to have a problem at this point anyway. Um, like Chris was talking about was testing. He was at 90% at six months. So we're talking about like closer to eight, nine months. Um, so they should have the quad index, but yeah, so quad index is the knee reactive and are they showing good? good movement control in a controlled setting first. And then I would start adding some reactive components, um, more unpredictable components, um, and just assess how they, again, similar similar kind of thing. Well, we have one last question, because I know we started a little bit later, so we try to get respect for everyone's time. The last question I think is a really point, important point, uh, point in terms of the rehab and that, you know, getting back people to play is a sexual, psychological readiness. And I know that we assess that Chris in the, in the return to play function and, and you know, um, probably historically haven't focused as much of that in terms of our return to play criteria um, and it's definitely emerging as a really important factor. Um, Chris, maybe you could highlight a little bit how that is played into the return to play battery and how um, that should be incorporated into um, time for return to play. Yeah, I think, um, you know, not outside of those questionnaires that um, that we we ask with our battery and then with the bear protocol, it's asking the IKDC routinely. And I think a lot of it's just like your day to day conversations with the athlete trying to gauge their confidence in it, trying to gauge any apprehensions they have. And then if they do have, if we're working through a certain phase um, of the rehab and they are apprehensive or they're, they do lack some confidence and, and maybe it's not, they're ver not verbalizing well, but maybe they're just showing it a little bit. I think spending a little bit more time in a certain phase, whether it's improving that sagittal plane control of the knee with some landing mechanic things, um, I think really just sticking to kind of like the meat and potatoes of, all right, do we have your quality of movement first? Because hopefully that will instill qual um, confidence. And then from there, just get a high volume of repetitions in over the ex over the extents of your rehab. So then they start to really feel like they can trust it. Because we know that if you're overly confident or underconfident, that could set you up for re-injury. So it's finding what works for that athlete and just being in good communication with them throughout the, the course of their rehab. Yeah, I think that's a great point. When I talk to patients about it, you know, you want people to be in like a happy medium. If you're overconfident, it's almost like in a danger zone, like you're just going to go a little reckless. So bringing people back down to the median is important as well. But um, thanks for you guys for your insights. That was really, really valuable and really useful. And hopefully um, for all of your um, people who logged in, thanks for jumping on. And if there's any questions or anything like that, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to help and um, as we build on our experiences and, and help you guys gain yours. So thanks everyone. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Thank you, Christopher and Ryan. Appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you all.